said before, I talk to them all the time. Our teams constantly coordinate. Um, we have a practice of not meeting with uh, leaders right before their elections, two weeks before their elections. Uh, as much as I love Angela, if she was two weeks away from an election, she probably would not have received an invitation to the White House. Um, and I suspect she wouldn't have asked for one. The leader in question is Benjamin Netanyahu, whom we'll get to in a moment. Now, in a world where our leaders are so concerned about their optics, perhaps certain front men and women need to understand it's not always about the pictures. It's about the words. And in a world gripped by terror attacks, America's drowning in an informational sea cast by the president that fails to see the killers in the minds of many. Not just the killers, but the victims for who they all truly are. Listen, much more on the docket. Let's welcome back noted attorney, political commentator, Newsmax contributor, multiple author. His latest... Terror Tunnels, the case for Israeli, uh, Israel's just war against Hamas. Alan Dershowitz joins us on the show. Alan, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on. Alan, are we making too much of this? And again, here comes the question that most of America is asking right now, because the president makes his statements about the attacks at the kosher deli shop in France, that they were people who randomly shot a bunch of folks mm -hmm. in a deli in Paris. The White House press secretary, Josh Ernest, came out and said, killed not being of who they were, but because of where they happened to be. Seriously now, are we making too much out of this, or is this a big deal in letting us know who this president still is? Well, the president made a very serious mistake um, when he said just folks were randomly killed. Obviously, the killer has said on his Facebook that he went to kill Jews and went to a kosher uh, store to find Jews. You know, it would be as if some, God forbid, somebody had been lynched and the person was black and the president would say, well, some, folk, some folks got lynched, but um, it had nothing to do with race. You know, you have to recognize it for what it is. I think it would have gone away had the White House staff then not doubled down on it. I think if they had just said, look, the president was speaking off the cuff, of course this was an attack on Jews because they were Jews, um, and uh, we acknowledge that. That would have been far, far better. I just got back from Paris. You know, I'm not an Orthodox Jew, but, and I never wear a kippah uh, except when I go to the synagogue. But when I went to Paris, I wore a kippah um, because I showed that I wasn't afraid of, uh, as so many are afraid, there, there is real fear among Parisian Jews, and the president did a terrible disservice when he made it sound like they were just random shootings. He what was just he, have he to, should apologize. What would he have to gain by this, though, Alan? Because there's the thing, if he is going to insult Jews and if he is going to make statements such as these, there's got to be an end game here, or is he simply just completely clueless about from whence he speaks? Well, I think he made a mistake. Uh, I think if he could take it back, he would. But then they doubled down, and that was the big mistake. The big mistake was doubling down, not saying, oh, my God, it was a spontaneous comment. And, of course, they were picked because they were Jews in a Jewish uh, uh, shop. Uh, nobody could doubt that. The man himself acknowledged that. Just like you know, the Charlie Hebdo people, they purposely picked those people because they had done offensive cartoons. Uh, you can't blink reality in this way. And it's part and parcel of the president's unwillingness to really talk about Islamic extremism and Islamic terrorism. You always have to say that the vast majority of Muslims are good, decent people, and they don't believe terrorism. But the terrorism that we're experiencing now comes from a variant on Islam, maybe a, 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 a terrible variant, but you can't just deny that reality. Alan, with about a minute left before we take a break, though, let's focus on this, though. Is it possible that the president's idea here and his people may be to tamp down any of the furor, to tamp down any of the anger, and maybe he is just trying to be the peacekeeper more than anyone else? Maybe that's what he thinks is the right thing to do. Well, you know, I, I can introduce him to a guy named Chamberlain. Uh, that's not called peacekeeping. That's called you know, accommodation, that's called conciliation. You cannot be conciliatory to terrorists. You have to say what terrorism is, and you have to call it by its name. And any terrorism has to be condemned. You can't be selective the way the French have been over the years. We, they only condemn terrorism when it hits their people. They were terrible when it came to terrorism that uh, attacked America, Israel, and other countries in the Middle East. 
But when it came home, they became obviously more concerned. And that's, that's kind of selfish and hypocritical. All right, we teased a little bit. If you would still stand by for a couple of minutes here, Alan, because we talked sure. a little bit here at the beginning about Benjamin Netanyahu. We are going to focus on that when we come back because there would seem to be some pushback even from people in Israel mm -hmm. wondering if the prime minister there has done the right thing. Alan Dershowitz will join us here in a couple of moments. We'll also go to the American courts when we return. The gay marriage case that may redefine Alabama and not in a manner some residents there would appreciate. And how to ferret out and prove a Jane Doe is nothing but a real fraud. That and so much more when we come back right here on Midpoint. Back to work. Let's welcome back attorney and author Alan Dershowitz in the Midpoint. Alan, let's get back to Benjamin Netanyahu here, because sure. according to the former Israeli ambassador to the U.S., Itamar Rabinovich, he spoke on Israeli radio on Monday and said, this is the sort of thing that leaves scars. The prime minister coming to speak in front of Congress and apparently the rebuke of the president. He went on to say, I fear that this sets the prime minister and the U.S. administration on a collision course. Is Benjamin Netanyahu making a mistake? I don't think so. I think you have to look at this beyond the personalities, behind the upcoming election. The issue is separation of powers. Congress has the power not to accept the bad deal that the president will make on Iran. And Congress has the right to hear from the most expert people, the people with the greatest interest. And I think it's a good thing that Netanyahu will be talking to Congress and telling them what the president doesn't want them to hear. Um, I don't think this would have happened if it had been about another issue. And remember, too, that the president sent the prime minister of England to lobby Congress against sanctions. And so this has to be looked at more broadly as an issue of separation of powers. Now, I have a suggestion that could break the law down. I don't know if it's a good suggestion. And that is, if Benjamin Netanyahu came and brought with him his opponent, uh, Yitzhak Herzog, who was running against him, and they both speak, and they both gave a unified view of, the dangers Israel faces from a bad deal, it would take politics out of it. It would turn it back into an issue of separation of powers with Congress having the power to disapprove of any deal the president makes. And that's clear under the Constitution that Congress has that power. The president would rather they not have it. He likes to pick and choose. Today he sent a bill to Congress with authorization to fight ISIS, but he doesn't want to send a bill to Congress with authorization to make a deal with Iran. Why? I mean, why is there such that split there, knowing full well it, it's, it doesn't take a genius to see what Iran is up to here right now? And there are many people who say that his authorization for war against Congress, he's just doing that right now just to be politically correct, make people happy, and move that on to the next president in 2016. I think that's probably right. What I worry about is the deal that the president will make will be a deal that will not go beyond his administration if it doesn't have the approval of Congress. Remember, it has a sunset provision, which means it ends in a number of years, and it means that Iran can develop nuclear weapons. And once the country is told it can develop nuclear weapons, it's already a nuclear power. And the Saudis are going to try to develop nuclear weapons. They're going to be shifting alliances because the uh, Iranians are going to be the big boy in the area with their nuclear weapons, if not three years from now, five years from now, ten years from now. But once the president says it's inevitable that you will get nuclear weapons, which is what this deal says, I think it makes a terrible terrible blunder and uh, risks making President Obama into Neville Chamberlain, the man who failed to see the greatest evil of the 20th century. And if President Obama fails to see the greatest evil of the 21st century, a nuclear-armed Iran, history will not be kind to him. I've got about two minutes left. I want to get your opinion on two things. First of all, what is happening in Alabama right now? Many counties refusing to allow same-sex marriage despite the rulings on Monday from a federal judge and the U.S. Supreme Court to get involved. It almost seems as if we've got a little insurrection going here in Alabama. Well, you know, for Chief Justice Moore is uh, uh, basically George Wallace. Um, he doesn't care about the law. He doesn't care about the Constitution. He gets his instructions from God. And God speaks to him directly and tells him what to do. And, you know, this is a constitutional crisis, and as always, he will lose, but he'll run for election and he'll win again, because the people of Alabama uh, don't want to see uh, law. They want to see religion. Well, what and, does that say about uh, the people of Alabama then, Alan? If, they, if this is a guy who you say is being bad. talked to by God, what does it say about them if they put this guy back in power? Well, they do. They keep putting him back in power. You know, he was removed from office yes. and charged with very serious... Uh, unethical conduct, and then he used that to write his, himself back to the chief justiceship. 
Look, this is the bad part of Alabama. Alabama's a great state. It has some wonderful people. It has some very progressive people. But this is the underside of Alabama. This is the side that we, we remember for standing up against desegregation. And here, here was another constitutional crisis, and it will end the same way. More will be relegated to the trash bin of history, but he'll be very popular among his constituents. Just another black eye, then, for Alabama? Well, for the judiciary in Alabama and for the voters. And that's why I don't think judges should be elected. I think judges should be appointed by a commission of experts. And the idea that you run on a platform of violating the law and get elected tells us something terrible about how we get to make people judges. It's, it's a very bad system. About 20 seconds here. Do you think maybe that Clarence Thomas, uh, Clarence Thomas tipped the hand the other day, basically indicating what the Supreme Court will do regarding gay marriage when they take it up in April? I think so. I think it's inevitable. We'll see um, a movement that can't be stopped in favor of constitutionality of, of gay marriage. It may take uh, ins and outs a little bit of time, but this is the quickest change uh, in any important social policy in history. I mean, even the president, quote, evolved, although we're now being told that he never evolved, that he was always in favor of gay marriage, but he just held back politically. But this is a major change, and it's going to be completed within a year or two. All right. Reminder once again, everybody, the book is called Terror Tunnels, The Case for Israel's Just War Against Hamas. It is always a pleasure to have Alan Dershowitz on the show. Thanks so much, Alan. Thank you so much. I All appreciate right. it. Take care. The end of an American era may be a true indicator of how a good part of America likes their news. Fake and funny. That's when we come back right here on Midpoint.